comes in her glasses <clears throat> so it's the 23rd I've seen you you've got to have seen the movie if you haven't seen the Molly crew movie I'm not really gonna give away too much but now you've seen it that and I watched it twice last night because uh, what I saw was actually two over two hours and uh, that was an hour and what 48 minutes and huge chunk was gone a few huge chunks were gone I'm like really really I mean not that you're missing a lot it seemed like they wanted to get these certain parts in and wrap it up into a but there's so many inaccuracies right from the beginning the truth that there is a true part where they had this fat dumbass was the first guitarist and everybody here <laughs> knows who he was and he was an idiot and he, and he was crying when he left so that is actually true <clears throat> and they did let Mick fire him because Mick just came in and he had all the ideas in his head he was 30 years old you think about it now my son's 34 that ain't old but even back then in 81 when I first went up to uh, Mick and talked to him, because that's the first time that I, me and my friend went to see them, it was like their second or third show that my, me and my friend went, and we went backstage, and I asked for Mick's autograph, and no one had ever, he'd never given his autograph as Mick Mars. So I got the first one. Yay! I'll have to pull it out and show it to you. It's on the back of a Troubadour ticket, a blue Troubadour ticket. So, it just says, to Mike, keep rocking, Mick Mars. Beep. And uh, so, right there, I knew he was cool. And I said, dude, you're the next Kiss. He goes, I fucking hate Kiss. And Nicky goes, all right. And Tommy's like, yeah. And I didn't ask for their autographs at all, because I was thoroughly impressed with Mick and continued to be. So, when I first saw this, I didn't like the Mick character because it wasn't Mick. It was, with the dry humor, but uh, actually, by the sixth time I watched it, I'm like, okay, I like this guy. I like the guy who's playing it. And I get the, what, how he's drawing from Mick's public sense. The, the way he presents himself publicly, like very short sense. But when you talk, he will talk for hours. I asked him about his amps, what he's playing, how he started playing, his favorite everything. Strings, why they tune down, you know, everything. I pulled on his hair. I asked him how old he was in, in 81, and he said 28. And then he smiled at his friend, who was his roadie. Uh, my friend will know their names. Uh, Stick, or Stick, and, and he called everybody Bone, I think. Yeah, everybody was a Bone. Hey, Bone. And that's how he signed my album, too. Bone. Hey, Bone. Da -da 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 -da. You know, they all signed it, and Tommy's is a big thing, but I got the first one. It was released on my birthday, 
December 11th, 1981, I turned 17, and Nikki was turning, do the math, I can't remember, I don't care. All I remember is like, Nikki, it's my birthday too. And he's like, no, shit, really? You know, two shots of Jack, you know, one for me and one for him. I'm, I, I had never drinking anything but beer. I'm thinking, what am I going to do? How am I going to do this? And I'm looking at my friend, he's just like, because he never drank either. So I just kind of held it down. It took me a few minutes, and my eyes were friggin' watery, but, you know, whatever. So there you go. I play a little bit. You know, I got a lot of my, the way I played by watching him for two friggin' years. So when I started playing, everybody said, dude, you sound exactly like Mick Mars. That's because I was playing exactly like Mick Mars, especially the rhythms. So anyways, uh... All that aside, the movie, the one that I saw was over two hours long. So apparently, I'm just guessing, I don't know, maybe it's going to be on the DVD. Because they left a lot out, and it's there. It's just not in the one they're showing. So, okay, whatever. And you know the gap, if you've seen it, there's a huge gap between, like, Theater of Pain and Dr. Feelgood. It's like, beep. It's like, what happened to girls, girls, girls? I mean, there's a mention of it. I mean, not just barely. Like, so I guess that montage of, of Tommy getting up, waking up at five, you know, you know, shaking it off, you start party, you know, you know, drums, you know, he's by this, you know, this time he's playing, he's a drum solo, he get back partying. Wakes up handcuffed to the bed because Doc would usually handcuff him to the bed so he wouldn't do something stupid. Because he was a stupid kid. When they got signed, he... I remember that he had his 19th birthday at the Whiskey 2, whatever day his birthday is, and we all sung happy birthday to him. You know, got pictures of him, you know, doing this. You know, he was a kid. He was a surfer kid. Like a skate... A, more of a boarder, skateboarder. And Vince was like a surfer. And Nikki is what, not what he wants. I mean, maybe he had a tough childhood, but they left out the whole part of his grandmother, his grandparents raising him. It was just like Dick Father, which, you know, he didn't talk much about it, but he's like, yeah, he just, he didn't talk about his parents at all. He talked about his grandparents. And it was in Idaho. And... You know, there's a lot of Mormon stuff <laughs> that I wish he would, you know, get out. His wife that he's married to now, Mormon, married by her bishop. Nikki's grandparents are Mormon. Nikki's mother's parents are Mormon. Idaho is just northern Utah. But that's whatever. So you start watching the movie. They did not have parties every night. I was there. And if you don't believe me, ask my friend George Carlston. Look him up. He will tell you didn't happen. Got to see how much time I got because this is running out. So that bugged me. They never played Gazaris. The car crashed. He was not in a Corvette. He was in a Pantera. And they weren't. didn't even make it to the liquor store. They were on the way to the liquor store and hit water, slid supposedly into another car. And I think it was like a Volkswagen or something. And, you know, poof, and that was it just goofy things and Y&T and Motley Crue did not happen at the whiskey or, or the star I can't remember now which one it is because they do all these flashes and the first shout of the devil date was not at the forum which they show it was at the Santa Monica Civic I was there too <laughs> um I mean what show wasn't I at um there's so many little goofy things that it bothered me and it bothered me. But last night when I sat down and said, okay, I'm going to watch it for entertainment purposes only. And it wasn't that bad. If you don't know, like also where they got in the argument where they used to rehearse was right over here in Burbank. Obviously I'm in Burbank now. At Audible Rehearsal where I used to rehearse with my band. One time, Motley Crue was in one room, 
my band, Trick or Treat, was rehearsing in the other room, and Wasp was in the other room. Three rooms in this building, Motley Crue, my band, Trick or Treat, the Satan Band, and Wasp. And it was nothing but debauchery. It was crazy. But it was fun. And got the, you know, hook up with, and it was on the Girls, Girls, Girls. It was 87-ish. Yeah, it was 87. And they were doing either, yeah, because they had a bunch of the theater of pain crap all over stuff. And they, th you know, we took a bunch of their friggin' stickers and pa backstage passes for theater of pain. Pigs, tons of stuff. Because they were done, they were doing the Girls, Girls, Girls stuff. And they'd ride in on their Harleys and park them in there and ride out. And I thought that was cool, but the guy, the manager stopped it. All that stuff. Uh, not major, but it wasn't in the movie. They did a, took a lot of liberties. But now you've seen it. It's not that bad. But it, it's not that good. <laughs> it could have been better. But hey, it's out. There you go. The dirt. And the songs, the last two fillers sounds like 6 a.m. trash to me and yes John 5 is playing you know help write the song with Nikki because Mick is in Nashville he doesn't really care he cares but he doesn't he, he's got other things on his mind and Vince is touring I mean he's been playing all over the place every small dinner club up in the Santa Clarita Valley he's played up there at a dinner club like 500 bucks a, for a table Really? You're Vince Neil, dude. Maybe the movie will help him. But uh, there you go. I think I'm out of time, so that's that. Go watch it if you haven't seen it. I haven't given out that much. And the way they end it is chump. <laughs> I like the stuff at the end, but they had a lot more. There's a lot more. Maybe it's going to come out on DVD. I don't know. <laughs> Later. Subscribe, comment, comment, and subscribe. I'm stuck at 700. Let's get that going. Got a couple guys to subscribe. I try to subscribe to everybody that subscribes to me, so let's be together. Isn't this thing going to run out? Oh, eight minutes. Son of a gun. Uh, there's not really much else except for a lot of stuff I can go on and on. Mainly the stuff at the beginning is fiction. It's really all fiction. They did not meet Vince at a party. See him the first time at a party. They went to a club where he was playing in rock candy. And Mick says, that is the guy. Look at the way he shakes his butt and gets all the girls. That's our guy. Mick said that. Not Nikki. There's a whole bunch of crazy. And then when Dot McGee's rattling off the band's kiss when he started managing motley crew in 83 he didn't manage kiss till 96 reunion tour and when he was fired like i think eddie trunk said it he wasn't fired for bringing nikki's mom to meet him he was fired over the whole russia thing as far as i don't even remember i i don't i didn't know he was even fired for years because i i you know, I remember I was actually touring, not a big tour, just a, like our usual Southwest thing. And I'm sitting in a ho motel room, motel, not a hotel, try and getting ready to play. And Dr. Feelgood came on. I'm like, wow, that band sounds like Motley Crue. And then, oh, it is Motley Crue. I'm like, wow, that sounds cool. So a few weeks later, I'm back and I'm at this girl's house not my girlfriend doesn't matter now not like she watches this but my I had a main girlfriend and then I always had like six or seven backups you know that was then you know repented da, da, da. I have I would never do that again because <laughs> that was not nice to the girls but uh I was at one of my girlfriend's houses and she had bought the album and we listened to the whole thing I'm like wow one good song at the beginning, and then it's uh, some kind of 
horrified Motley Aerosmith mess. I don't like Dr. Feel Good. I'm like, that is the sellout album. Absolutely. I think Girls, Girls, Girls was better, even though Nick was, you know, on smack. He wasn't writing, he never wrote music. He came up with melodies and he did the lyrics. Most of the lyrics. Almost all of them. Because he was good that way. I mean, look at the beginning lyrics, you know, Too Fast for Love. They are very street, basic, goofy, stealing from a lot of sources, but made it Motley Crue. Cool. But Mick was the one that wrote the music. And I'm very glad that they gave him credit for even coming up with the name, because he did. He came up, his band had a drum riser that went up and flipped upside down. The band before Motley Crue, White Horse or whatever. You can see it on YouTube. Nothing in Motley Crue. It was all Mick's idea. So, I don't know. I'm, I'm a big Mick guy. I really like him, and I wish he would get more credit than he does. And But Nikki takes it. Nikki wants to be the big bad rock star that OD'd. Okay, great. Who hasn't OD'd? Who hasn't been in rehab a couple times? <laughs> Probably a lot of you, but I have. And even when I... And people are like, well, why don't you talk to Nikki still? All right. Well, I've run into him, but I don't have coffee with him every week. I don't even remember the last time I talked to him, but I have talked to him since the accident and I said I've died t two more times than you so you know I got you and he just like <laughs> I don't even know where why when I said it because it was hazy it was right after my accident but I you know hey I died twice three times so that's two more than you and ODing it, it happens when you do all that crap I shouldn't say that I shouldn't make it so common but if my movie comes out, which I got two titles now, either One Flew Over the Sunset Strip, Michael D. Stewart, or Walking through, through the Valley of the Shadow of Fame. Huh? Huh? I like that one. Anyways, um, guys writing the script now, well, I hope. I mean, I've been saying this for years, but I've also been writing the album for years. And I've decided to write an album instead of I was going to write one that was, I don't know, it's going to be more like uh, Saints of Los Angeles, kind of like a story, but not the story of my band, because I had three bands, so it's the story of me, the, and what I did, and went through, and da da da, so it starts, you know, Live Fast, Die Young is the first song, second one is Drunk and Disorderly, which is an old song, but rewriting it. And then it goes into the new stuff, Eternal Darkness, uh, Creeping Sensation, which is about drugs. And, you know, it'll be a cool album. I think it should be out this year, I hope. Got the guy that's going to do the artwork for it. And apparently it's going to just be me on the cover because I can't pull a, a band together that can meet in one place. It's crazy. Maybe when the album comes out, it'll be easier to find people. But you'd think in L.A. I could find a drummer. But you wouldn't believe the crazy people I come up against. It's insane. I understand they're all old, and most of them are, you know, got into the family thing late. That's your problem, not mine. <laughs> Whatever. I need it. I need a band, but, you know, go watch the movie. It's entertaining, but it's way off course. And there's so much liberty taken in the storyline that it's just ridiculous. But if you don't know it, it's not bad. You might think, hey, it's a really cool movie. That's pretty cool. But just know that from the beginning to it's almost all fiction. It's something made up and switched around and stuff that happened was like the whole story with Vince's daughter that was late later later they I don't know and look at just the two things that Vince went through and everybody gets mad at him for killing Razzle he didn't kill Razzle Razzle didn't he didn't pull him into the car and say you get in this car and I'm gonna 
kill us, you know, no, or kill you. No, 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 no. Dude, back in the friggin' early 80s, drunk driving was, there was Mothers Against Drunk Driving had just formed in the mid 80s after Vince's accident. So you could actually get away with drunk driving. I was stopped a lot and they just had harassed me and let me go. And I was booed. Now there's no way they'll do that, of course. Which is why, you know, I got two DUIs. I'm like, enough of this crap. I'm not going to go to jail again. Stop. So I haven't drank in over 21 years. Because it's stupid. And, you know, there you go. I'm not going to start preaching. I'm just going to jam since I got minutes left. <laughs>